Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. On this fine, chilly, rainy day. In the middle of the summer, I'd say, if you need to rain, but we do like that. <laughs> Can everyone hear me? I've changed the microphone, I've changed the volume. Is everyone able to hear me? Raise your hand if you can. Okay, good. Today is morning prayer, right two, and it is the sixth Sunday after Epiphany. Let us give praises to our Lord through songs and scripture from the rising of the sun to its setting. My name shall be great among the nations, and in every place incense shall be offered to my name. And a pure offering for my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Let us stand and sing hymn 304. Come, let us adore. 
now you still are not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For as long as there is jealousy and quarreling among you, you are not who are of the flesh, and are you not of the flesh and behaving according to human inclinations? For when one says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not merely human? What is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have common purpose. Each will receive wages according to their labor of each. For we are God's servants working together. You are God's fields, God's building. Here is the lesson. Please stand and sing hymn 474. Everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in 
his heart. It is better for you to, excuse me, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away, or it's better for you to lose one of your members than your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard it that it is said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be, yes, yes, and no, no. Anything more comes from the evil one. Today's uh, reflection is entitled, All Sinners, and it was written by the Reverend Joshua Goldron. There have been many good and talented comedy troops throughout the years. Burns and Allen, Martin and Lewis, the original cast of Saturday Night Live, for instance, and of course, there was Monty Python. But of all the wonderful comedy troops from Second City, to the Upright Citizens Brigade, one of the very best has to be the kids in the hall. Active in the 1990s, these comedians are genius, featuring such reoccurring characters as Chicken Lady, Mr. Head and Foot, It's a Fat Girl, and who could ever forget Head Crusher. One of the most memorable of their many sketches featured a preacher it starts with a preacher weighing the Bible and the Hindu holy book, the Gita, and marveling that the Bible weighed more. He mentions our need to think about that. Then he noted that preachers must be important because all good comedians have a preacher character. Preacher characters are a solid comedic device. If you have an everyday line like, get off the phone, You've got nothing. But if you say, get off the phone, sinner, well then, you're halfway to a joke. At the end of the comedian's sermon on the importance of preacher characters, he read the Bible in one hand and, and another book on the other hand, finishing with this thought-provoking question. Which weighs more, the Bible or a collection of Gary Larson's Far Side cartoons? Well, today it seems that we've got our preacher character. But it seems we have lost, hopefully temporarily, our powerful language of sin. The question is, what is sin good for? What is sin good for? There certainly are some good reasons for being good. Having a decent society is a good reason. If everyone did whatever he or she wanted, things would be chaotic and destructive. On the other hand, for millennia, those in power have attempted to use ethics and the notion of sin to control the bodies of the populace. But besides all this good citizenship, 
What is the point of having a concept of sin and not committing sin? In today's Gospel passage, we get a section of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus expands the Ten Commandments. He expands them to perhaps an extreme and unrealistic level. He equates murder and anger, calling a brother a fool with blasphemy and lustful thoughts with adultery. For example, who among us has not been angry? Who among us has not called our brothers fools? Certainly our siblings have called us, if not fools, we were verbal equivalent. Are they all bound for hell? Who among us has not had something against someone or been lustful? Some of us, mostly good people I suppose, are divorced. Most of us have also sworn oaths as well. How are we to understand this part of Jesus' most famous sermon? It can leave a lot of people feeling helpless. What exactly did Jesus expect? Perfection? If we separate Jesus' sermon from Jesus himself, we are indeed in big trouble. You see, these prescriptions for behavior are to be closely tied to our understanding of Jesus as the Son of God. Specifically, Jesus is not merely giving a new way of living that is impossible. Rather, he is creating the new community of those who live as if Jesus is Lord. In a word, the church. So, we begin to see that these ways of living that Jesus prescribes are more about the community than individual persons. I wager that everyone here, upon hearing these laws, they doubt, felt hopeless, guilty, and perhaps a little resentful, asking, who can live that way? Indeed, no one can live these standards on their own. That's actually the whole point. These prescriptions for living are meant to take away our confidence in our own individual goodness and instead rely on God and each other more and more. So we begin to see this part of Jesus' sermon as the constitution of a community, and as a community that no longer trusts in its own <coughs> righteousness. This is where the Church and Alcoholics Anonymous share something in common. Members of both gather for the express purpose recognizing that they do not have power over their own righteousness. Instead, we need God and we need each other. Hello, my name is Catherine. I'm a sinner. One of the problems with sin is that we have made it rather large and cosmic. But sin is our daily companion, often consisting of the little wanderings from the way of God into our own ways. Yes, sin is cosmic and, by a, and a byproduct of a created universe that allows for freedom of choice. But mostly sin is daily and, well, domestic. If we have this community-created aspect of Jesus' sermon in mind, then we begin to notice a new coloring, color entering it. If Jesus draws out the communal aspect of sin, when he says that if any of them have anything against a brother or a sister, they should keep their offering at the temple, leave, become reconciled with that brother or sister, and only then return to the temple. Jesus is trying to get us to know that our relationship with our neighbors, that's everyone, is reflected in our relationship with God. What good is it? To say our prayers and receive our Eucharist if you are hateful to another person. There is a seamless continuity between our relationship with God and all our other relationships. The divorce statements in this sermon might make some of you squirm. No one is here to make divorce fine and good, though of course it may be necessary in some cases. But what Jesus is describing is a community that doesn't require the remarriage of women. 
Remember that these words were spoken at a time when a woman was economically and socially required to be married. If she was, if she was not, then great sin must have accompanied her. Here, Jesus is constituting a community whereby, in the words of the theologian Stanley Hallowas, that women who have been abandoned do not have to be remarried, then surely the church must be a community of friendship that is an alternative to the loneliness of the world. In the first century, the conservative parochial Roman family would have looked at the immoral Christian community as a den of iniquity and unusual friendships. Jesus' teaching on the taking of oaths is probably the best indicator of his community creation ethic that is centered on him. Here, he tells us not to swear by anything, and instead let your yes be yes and your no be no. Oaths are interesting because when you think about it, they basically say, we usually lie a little bit or a lot, but in this case, I really mean it. Taking an oath means that lying and deception are the usual workings of things. But now I'm really telling the truth. Have you been in a situation where someone says something outlandish and you respond, really swear to it? No, Jesus is saying that in the Christian community, what you can expect from Christians is speech that is disciplined to the truth. Just as Jesus' teaching about the gift at the altar of God and our relationships with our neighbors are bound together, so too is our speech. We should always be mindful that our speech is ever before God. Taking an oath should not be necessary because everything that we say happens in the presence of God. What we have then in this sermon is Jesus making an ethical community that needs God and each other. A community that no longer lives by the virtue of its own righteousness, and instead knows its sin all too well. Yes, we are sinners. Now what? If we didn't sin, we wouldn't need God. And we definitely need God. Listen to me. There is no harsher thing than seek harder thing than seeking forgiveness when you are convinced you are good. What you do, what do you have to be forgiven for? Well, look at Jesus' sermon. How are you doing? By that measure. These so-called rules are not here to make you feel bad. They are here to draw you closer to God and to your brothers and sisters here in this congregation. Once you realize that you are not as good as you thought, then you begin to rejoice in the goodness of God. I'll note that it's nearly impossible to receive forgiveness from someone who knows that they are good and that you are bad. But if Jesus' sermon has taught us anything, it's not that all of us, it's that, sorry, let me try that again, it's that all of us, all of us have fallen short of what God wants and it is our common knowledge of that fact that binds us together. If we say that we are not without sin, we deceive ourselves. So to be a sinner is actually a moral and ethical feat. It is those convinced of their own righteousness who do not feel the need for forgiveness, and that should scare us. We are all sinners, and that is good. Now, this is the final line of the sermon. We are all sinners, and that is good. Amen. Please stand and let us say the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God.
Because our weakness, in our weakness, we can do nothing good without you. Give us the help of your grace that in coming to your commandments and keeping your commandments, we may please you both in will and need through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hardwood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit, that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you, to the honour of your name. Amen. Amen.
I ask your prayer for God's people throughout the world, for our bishop, Michael Kirsch and Susan Hayes, and for this gathering for all ministers and people, and pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, for all the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. We pray especially for Cindy, Mary Lynn, Thorsten, Dick, Paula, Vicki, Nicole and Laura, Sharon, Tom, Kathleen, James, Jay and Sabine, Jamie, Kathy, Christia, Val, Tony, Pat, Father Jim, Father Ty, Devin, Katie, Barbara, Karen, Colleen, Catherine, Savannah, and Roger. And we pray especially for those in Syria and Turkey impacted by the earthquake and all of those in the war-torn Ukraine. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of him. Pray that we may find him and be found by him. I ask your prayers for those who have departed. Pray for those who have died. I ask your prayers for those celebrating birthdays especially Carolyn Mason. And I ask for thanksgiving for all those folks who need it. Praise God for those in every generation who, in whom Christ has honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayer of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us say the general thanksgiving together. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we your unworthy servants, you give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your inevitable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of the Lord. And in every way, give us such an awareness of your mercy
announcements. The flowers today were given by Tom and Louise Randolph in loving memory of his no, cousin. No, it's not today. It's not today? It's for Sherry. Sherry, that's all. That's all. Okay. <laughs> um, let's see, where are we here? Um, as a reminder, on February 26th, we will have Canon James Harlan celebrating the Holy Eucharist with a guest speaker who is the Canon Lydia Kelsey Buckland. She serves as Canon to the Ordinary for Discipleship and Mentality in the Episcopal Diocese of Northern Michigan. And she is the director of the Mutual Ministry Initiative of Virginia Theological Seminary, which we potentially are to become involved in. Um, little side note there, um, talking to some people who I met at the DCDI um, training, is in northern Michigan, they do not have a full-time priest at any church there. They are all supplies or part-times. So we can still make this go. It has been done other places. It's new to this diocese, but we can make it work. It's been done before. It's not new. Both will be available for questions and answers after the worship service, and there will be a luncheon and great conversation. Starting March 5th, we will be offering Holy Communion service at 3 p.m. We are in need of ushers, and there will be training involved. Contact Steve or myself. On February 28th, which is a Tuesday, there will be a seven-week Lenten Bible study at noon on Tuesdays. The book is The God We Can Know by Rob Duque. It's an interesting name. We will start with new time prayer, have lunch, uh, David has volunteered to cook, and then Bible study. There will be a sign-up sheet in the parish hall. Everyone is welcome. It's not just for the ladies, it's for the guys. Um, bring your neighbors if they're interested. We just need to know how many people so we can have lunch prepared. Sunday Night Live will be here on February 19th at 4 o'clock. And there is a light lunch after that meal, after that service. There will be an Ash Wednesday service at 11 o'clock here with imposition of ashes but no communion. The Hope Center volunteers will gather at the parish hall Tuesday afternoon on the 14th for an assembly line um, construction of sandwiches for distribution at the Hope Center on the 15th. All willing hands and hearts are welcome to enjoy this outreach program project. It will be at 3 o'clock p.m. Tuesday 14th and or um, delivering them at 10.30 Wednesday on the 15th. Any other announcements? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship the Holy Spirit be with, be with us all evermore. Let us go forth to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.